Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so let's start today uh, with this talk. So my name is Bel Miro. Um, I'm a cloud architect at CERN. And with me, I have. Did you do? No, OK, it's work. I'm Spiros. I'm also a cloud engineer at CERN. I was, I'm core member of the Magnum project, and I used to be the PPL one. And I contribute mostly in the cloud for uh, ser service management in general and specifically for Kubernetes in Magnum. So what we'd like to talk about today is about our control plane. Um, we have a control plane uh, that we have been presenting um, during the past summits. Uh, it has some particularities that we're going to explain. But the main topic today is our attempt to move from our control plane running in VMs to Kubernetes. We are still in the initial phase, an evaluation phase. Uh, so what we're going to show you is basically what we are thinking about. Yeah, makes sense. So but first, first, this will not be a certain talk without a little bit of introduction about what we do. And actually, we are in a different continent, so let's introduce the organization. So CERN is the European organization for nuclear research. Uh, it's the biggest international scientific collaboration in the world. More than 10,000 scientists work in the organization. Um, and the, the main mission of CERN is to do particle physics, fundamental research. For that, CERN offers facilities to scientists all around the world. And the, one of the main things that CERN offers is a very complex set of particle accelerators. For particle physics, this is a fundamental uh, machine. You can see there, <coughs> this picture is taken from France side. So CERN sits in the border between France and Switzerland. Very close to Geneva, you can see the Geneva Airport, the Geneva Lake, and also the Alps. And you can see here, these little rings is the accelerators that we provide to physicists. Um, our main accelerator is the LHC. It's a 27 kilometers ring. Uh, it is 100 meters underground. And it accelerates beams of particles in two different directions. And these beams of particles collide in these big four experiments. It's big, it's detectors, we call them experiments. Uh, that is CMS, LHCB, Atlas, and ALICE. So if you see, look into this picture, CERN headquarters is basically that little thing there. So for you to have an idea about the scale. So this is inside of the tunnel of the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. And you what, you what you see there is the magnets. And that are those blue pipes that you see there. And uh, in the LH, uh, LHC, we have more than 10,000 of these big blue pipes, the uh, magnets. There are different kinds of magnets. Once they bend the beam, others focus the beam of particles. And they can have between 5 to 15 meters long, these beams, these magnets. And they can weight more than 35 tons, each one. So you, you imagine the effort of mounting, to of having this infrastructure 100 meters underground in a tunnel. Uh, but these are not ordinary magnets. Uh, these are sub, uh, superconducting magnets, meaning that they conduct electricity without any resistance. And to achieve that, they need to be cooled down to minus 271 degrees Celsius. So that is colder than the outer space. It's a lot of helium to achieve this. So imagine the, the operations required to, to have this infrastructure running. So this accelerates two, two beams of particles, and then they collide in these detectors. Um, we have four of these detectors. Uh, they look a little bit different, each of one. And these machines are huge. They have up to 45 meters long, 25 meters in diameter, and they can weigh more than 12,000 tons, each one. All of this, of course, is 100 meters underground. Uh, and basically, a detector is a digital camera. 
not the ordinary camera like you have in your phone, they can take up to 40 million pictures per second. So we can get more than one petabyte of data per second. Of course, you cannot store all that data. So wha what the experiments have is triggers, hardware filters, and they'll filter most of the information, the ones that th the information that they think they already know or is not interesting for science because we already know that. So we reduce, if we keep the analogy, these 40 million pictures to around 1,000 uh, 1, pictures per second. This is only a few gigabytes per second that is sent to our data center. It's still a huge challenge to store constantly um, 10 gigabytes per second, uh, but it's much better than one petabyte per second. Um, So, and to support all of this, uh, during the last years, so we have the OpenStack in production since July 2013. We are building an OpenStack cloud that help us to process all this data. This is one of the monitoring dashboards that we have. You see that we have about um, 300,000 cores. That number went a little bit down because we needed to disable SMT because all the security vulnerabilities during the last year. Um, number of VMs, more than 30,000 VMs, uh, more than 4,000 projects. Magnum clusters, they are becoming very popular in our um, organization. Now we have more than 500. And in terms of compute nodes, uh, we are doing some changes. We have around 9,000 compute nodes. Okay, so this was a little bit uh, an overview of our infrastructure. So let's talk about the architecture of our control plane. <coughs> so something that we do from the beginning is to isolate each component. So from the beginning that we when we were thinking about the architecture, that for us, uh, it was not really trivial how to deploy the control plane because we didn't want to have uh, every component or all the components together in two, three physical nodes. So we wanted to spread as much as possible our control plane. To do that, we could deploy another cloud to run our control plane, have a or have a lot of physical nodes only dedicated for the control plane, but we decided to run our control plane in the infrastructure itself. So what we do is we have our control plane, each box that you see there is basically a virtual machine that runs this component in an isolated way. So we're gonna have 10 virtual machines for Keystone, 10 virtual machines for Glance, when I say 10 is the number that we are running, uh, considering the scale that we have. It's Cinder, a virtual machine that runs all those components, same for Magnum, same for every component uh, for OpenStack. Even the databases, each database is isolated in, in each own uh, virtual machine or physical nodes. We don't have a huge MySQL database and I have all the, all the databases there. So we try to isolate as much as possible. So <coughs> in terms of also Nova architecture, because we run cells, we have the API nodes, around 20 API nodes, and then the, con the top cell controller and placement, 15 and 30 for each. And then we have the cells. We have 80 cells. For each cell, we run only one um, control plane. That control plane includes Rabbit, the Nova API and Conductor. Unfortunately, we are still running Nova Network for some of them. And then we have the compute nodes that in average, it's 200 per cell. Um, one thing that you can see here is Rabbit uh, runs in the same VM and is dedicated per cell. So we have a lot of different Rabbits that are independent. We only run one Rabbit cluster that is for the top cell controller. For each cell then, they ha it has its own rabbit in, in queue. Why? Because for us, we have this kind of architecture because we can afford losing a cell. If, we, if one of those VMs running the cell control plane goes down, means that the user will not be able to create instances in that cell. However, the VMs that are created will be 
co will continue to, to run, meaning that this will be almost transparent for the user unless he's trying to delete an instance. But considering our use case for batch processing, we can afford that. All right. So to summarize more or less what I said, uh, Cloud Inception, everything that you saw there runs in infrastructure itself, meaning that, of course, to bootstrap all of that, initially we needed physical machines. However, now we remove them. Everything is running on top of the, of the cloud. Uh, advantages, um, each open source component runs in, in a different VM, so we have isolation, meaning that we can upgrade each OpenStack component uh, in a different time. So we, we initially we start with Keystone, two weeks after we upgrade maybe Glance and so on. Um, disadvantages, of course also this means that we have a lot of VMs that we need to manage. We are managing this with Foreman and Puppet, but anyway, it's difficult to manage all these VMs. As you saw in the previous slide, we have 20 APIs plus all the control plane for the cells at the end is uh, almost 100 VMs that we have for the all the OpenStack control plane. Of course, this creates then uh, unused resources because Nova API will not be consuming all the resources of that VM, uh, and which causes some inefficiencies. Um, and this is what we are trying to, to remove from our cloud, is inefficiency, because for a cloud that is dedicated for scientific computing, any overhead, any inefficiency means that we are not using that CPU cycles for research. That is the mission of the organization. So what we see here is exactly the same diagram. Everything that has color is what we virtualize. Okay, you see that everything runs in a VM. Not everything, even the databases are managed by our database team, run on top of our clouds, which can cause some issues. So we don't have all the databases virtualized. Some of them run in physical nodes, the ones that are critical to bootstrap the cloud. All right, so this is another view of what I just said. So we have different cells, different availability zones, each availability zone contains different cells. And then the control plane runs side by side to the, with the user VMs. Okay, so what we, we are running this for a few years now. So what we want to change? Why we want to move to Kubernetes or at least try it and see if we can get some benefit from that. What this will mean the way we want to move to Kubernetes is to run it in the same way we are running our VMs, meaning that it will continue with inception with one more layer. What we want to achieve is to create the Kubernetes clusters using Magnum, that is VMs on top of the cloud, and then run the control plane that will be pods that run inside those VMs. So you see all this inception. Advantages, this will mean that we're gonna have a strong consolidation because we will uh, use it more efficiently all the resources. Our, control pl our Kubernetes cluster could be much smaller and run much more components because it's not, it will not be one VM for one Nova API, another VM for Nova Scheduler, for example. So we'll be able to consolidate much more inside that Kubernetes cluster. That for us is a big advantage. And it'll be much faster to, to iterate, because right now, creating a VM, it's fast, but then all the configuration, using the configuration management tools that we have, it takes, um, it takes some time, so it will be faster iterations. Cloud native auto-scaling, so we will be able to scale up and down the cluster and then the applications inside. If it will be easy for us if we are having uh, high demand of requests to increase the number of APIs much faster than today. So today what we have is we have some hot standby VMs that if we have a lot of requests on the Nova API side, we just configure them to be Nova APIs and they join the load balancer and start acting as Nova APIs. So with Kubernetes, that will be much easier or we expect this to be much easier and faster. 
disadvantages, one more inception layer uh, with all the implications that that causes. Um, the support of the infrastructure, this is a big change for us because over the years we have been using that model, meaning that all the log consumption monitoring is integrated in our configuration management system. Removing that and moving to Kubernetes, we'll need to do that work from scratch. And uh, not all stuff is used yet uh, with Kubernetes, so meaning that um, the operations team will need to get used to, to Kubernetes. So the final result that we expect is to have this. Instead of having all those VMs running the services, we're going to have the Kubernetes cluster and all the services will run inside those VMs. For example, like this. And this is to basically to illustrate the inception that we have. So imagine these VMs were uh, created using Magnum, orchestrated to be a Kubernetes cluster. We have all these pods that will be our control plane running. Um, so then to create a VM, a user VM, you see that is those components that will intervene to create that user VM that is side by side the other VM. This is a little bit confusing. Uh, this is, these are the easy examples. Um, for example, this is for Magnum. So Magnum to, de to deploy another cluster will use the components that, are already that were already deployed by Magnum. This gets really confusing with the Ironic resources that we also use with Ironic. Um, so basically we create Ironic resources using the cloud that are hypervisors and then we put all the other stack on, on top. <coughs> right, so let's talk now about Helm. Um, one of the things that we try, we try several things um, to run our control plane in Kubernetes is Helm. Um, not just manifest, but uh, packaged um, charts uh, with Helm. So what is Helm? Helm is the package manager of Kubernetes, is the pip uh, of Kubernetes, and it has a very large, it, its strongest point is that it has a very large selection of community managed charts uh, or, or packages uh, that are distributed as tarballs. And all these charts have a business logic for the applications. So for example, for a very big uh, component like um, um, Nginx Ingress, which is specific to Kubernetes or Drupal, uh, all the configuration is factored out to a single file. And um, this provides some benefits and simplicity in configuration. But simplicity if you are not a very corner case user. Um, uh, you can use the charts that are provided by the community and hosted in um, public clouds like uh, Google Cloud or AWS but you can also host the charts that you build on your own cloud. If you have S3 and uh, Swift, you can use Chart Museum, uh, which is uh, just a server component uh, for Helm to manage a uh, pool and push uh, charts from there like you do with a container registry. Um, I will describe briefly the usage of Helm. Uh, this is for version two. I will, vers I will mention only version two and not version three because it's only just out version 3 and OpenStack Helm that we'll mention later uses v2. So typical steps is that you have already the Kubernetes cluster. You need to configure the client. I have also posted a very important link to do it securely, not just expose uh, the server-side component of Helm securely, which is one of the biggest uh, security holes that you can create in your cluster. And then you add some chart repositories, for example, your chart museum deployment, and then the workflow is that you inspect the charts, you never just pull a tarball and then pass it as admin or as a user that has access to credentials to your cluster, and then you install some charts. So in code, uh, in commands, it looks like this. You do Helm init with TLS, as I mentioned. You add your repo, which is an example that works as charts or something. Then you do an update. You update all the dependencies. You do template first to see what you're doing and to be sure you're not installing something crazy. And then you do Helm install and you install your app with this uh, values file that contains all of your configuration. Um, I won't describe OpenStack Helm, it's a very big project. Uh, and these two numbers show it clearly. So the OpenStack Helm, which is only the OpenStack component is 20 repos, but all the additional requirements are 46 repos. 
This is not specific to Kubernetes or Helm. If you run a cloud, you need all these 46 components. You need a load balancer, you need monitoring, you need um, a network plugin, um, you need a um, uh, load balancer and so on. Um, one of the most crucial parts uh, for managing um, services, not only with Kubernetes, but also with Kubernetes, is secret management. Um, one very important tool, at least for us, that we uh, created was um, uh, a plugin for Barbican that I'll mention later, but what are the requirements for secret management? Um, most teams to be efficient and have uh, standard procedures, they need to do a GitOps, um, Git to have a GitOps uh, workflow, so everything is managed with Git, uh, secrets, configuration, and uh, all the changes are managed with pull requests with uh, at least two approvers, ideally, or one. Um, for specifically for Helm, the requirements are also to not change upstream charts. So for example, we don't want to patch anything in OpenStack Helm. And um, we want for our secret management to integrate with standard Helm commands and not just introduce something new uh, or another layer or another component. Um, what we also want to have is to leverage the existing infrastructure that we have for authentication in our case, it's Keystone. Uh, it's backed by Active Directory, but it, it would be ideal to manage um, for authentication and authorization with Keystone and use the existing infrastructure and then the integration we have done with Active Directory. So now we'll talk for the Barbican plugin that we have implemented and uses the OpenStack API service. Um, this is the illustration of um, how to use it. So you will have the user that there is an encryption key stored in Barbican. If this encryption key doesn't exist, the first time that we that you try to use the plugin is generated. Um, so first, you export your OpenStack token. It uses token authentication only. It doesn't use any um, uh, password authentication uh, because at least in our cloud we use Kerberos and we don't want to encourage users to use passwords. So what it does is either fetches the key from Barbican or generates it encrypts the passwords or other secrets that you might have, encodes in base 64 and stores in the file system. Then you push to Git, your colleagues can review, they can pull out, they can pull the branch, or they can, uh, or you can have a CICD that uses the secrets. And then you do instead of Helm install, Helm secrets install. Um, the secrets uh, binary, uh, which is a Helm plugin, it just wraps the install command so it detects if a file is encrypted or not tries to decrypt it with a key in Barbican and then passes it to the Helm binary to eventually install. Um, as it's in the Kubernetes ecosystem and Helm, um, the, um, the plugin is written in Go and one of the latest important additions that we did uh, that I mentioned at the end is that all the uh, edit of secrets when they are in plain text, it's done in memory. So the um, passwords never touch the file system. Um, this is how it looks uh, in code. Uh, this is the, the help output. So we have some decrypt encrypt commands that you don't necessarily need. We have a view command that you can just take the encrypted file and, sh and you can just see it. And then we have install, upgrade, and lint, which are for Helm. And which is the wrapper commands that they take the encrypted files, decrypt, and pass to the Helm binary. Um, this is how the workflow looks. So we have a service, let's say in this case it's Glance, and we do Helm view, Helm secrets view, and the encrypted file, and we can see that we have uh, some passwords there. And then we do Helm secrets install, which will take the encrypted file, decrypt it, and pass it to Helm. And then we can do Helm secrets edit. It will uh, spawn Vim. You can edit your secrets in memory, save them, uh, and get encrypted, and then upgrade or push to Git. I will pass to Belmir again for Loki. Okay. Um, so other thing that we need uh, if we have a containerized infrastructure is images. Uh, so we start looking what is upstream, what we can benefit of from. And one of the things is OpenStack Loki. So this project uh, is designed to build quickly images, uh, OCI compatible. Basically, all the OpenStack services. And 
actually, this is great. Uh, if you haven't looked into this project, have a look if you are looking to deploy containers. Um, because it's so flexible <coughs> to create the images for your projects the way you want them, um, that we really recommend this. It's a very flexible tool. Um, there is a base image that is naturally support, and then basically you can customize whatever you want. So when we saw this, um, this is a right fit for us. We have some dependencies because our internal patches, and these help us a lot to build our images. So have a look into Locky projects. <coughs> so and now we're gonna start with the use cases. If now, <coughs> I'm sorry. If now it looks clear that maybe Elm it's a good solution to deploy uh, the control plane, when we started doing this, it was not that clear that we wanted to use Elm. And actually, we wanted to move faster. And with the best way to move faster is to have something running in production. Uh, if you have your development cloud, it will always be your development cloud, and you'll be scared to move this into production. So we wanted to have something. Uh, a part of the control plane running Kubernetes very fast. Also for us to get a real feeling what it is when we expose this to the users. And uh, looking to OpenStack Helm, as Piro said, it's a big, big project, it's complex. It's very, very, at least for in, in, the initial understanding of the project, that takes a lot of time. And um, we knowing uh, Kubernetes, that was not really the fastest way to move forward. Uh, we wanted a more controlled experience. We actually wanted to know what we were doing. If we are basically deploying that with Elm, we'll not learn a lot. We need to go through the code to try to understand what Elm is doing behind the scenes to deploy the service. So the first thing, basically, what we did was look into what was done, pick a simple service like Lens, and see what Elm is doing behind the scenes. And uh, you can do the Elm fetch to get basically the shard and the templates, and you're gonna see all the steps, all the manifest, all the YAML that is generated by, by Elm. So what is needed, what is are the basic components to deploy something, an OpenStack component using Kubernetes? We need an image. We'll need a config map for the configuration of the service. Then we're gonna need a deployment, basically, to trigger Lens API, and a service, basically, to expose this to outside. It's basically that for a simple service like Lens. If you look into Elm, uh, there are much, a lot of stuff there that we actually don't really need for the simplest use case. So let's start simple. We got all the, that YAML from Elm, we remove everything that we didn't understand at the time or we thought that, okay, it's not interesting for us. And we try to make it as, to look as the production service as much as possible. Um, so we basically got our configuration file that we are running production for Glance. We put that in a config map. The deployment, it's only Glance API to run that. And it's basically what we did. The problem was what to do about the secrets. Uh, the secrets are embedded in the configuration file. Fortunately, OpenStack supports several configuration files. So what we did was have a glance config for the configuration file and the another configuration file only with the secrets, the database secrets plus the, all the service accounts. And that is a Kubernetes secret that we configured manually. Um, Ingress, uh, for this, for Ingress, we, we use Nginx, and what we did is using the recipe that we have for Elm, so not, nothing fancy. <coughs> um, so what are the, the difference uh, of using Elm? Basically, we understand from the beginning all this process. Uh, it's very easy to understand, to deploy. It's basically only a few components, this deployment and configuration and config map. We started all configuration on Git, as we always do, and when we added, this took like a very few time to, do, to have this configuration working, 
And then we deploy this into production. Basically, we point that the endpoint in our H AJ proxy, and the users, every time that start using Glance, any API call that uses Glance, can go through the, the setup that we have in Kubernetes. So we run all the VMs and the Kubernetes deployment in parallel uh, in Glance, I in, uh, in parallel, yes. So this is how it looks like. If we do inside that cluster, get pods, you see that th this is very small and we only have one pod for the Glance API, the others are for the, uh, MG for the ingress. Um, because it's very simple. We don't need anything compli complex to, uh, to, have, uh, to have a Kubernetes um, deployment run in the control plane. So after this running, we started more complex things and now Sir will talk about them. So after the initial investigations um, of Helm, uh, from, for OpenStack Helm, and the deployment of uh, Glance, uh, after a lot of frustration with um, all the dependencies that we had to manage, we started to figure it out. Um, this is great, you can do almost a bit of GitOps without automation, but uh, with just uh, the Git workflow. Uh, but then you cannot uh, iterate fast and take upstream, pro uh, upstream changes uh, easily. So the second use case is one of the service that actually I knew very well, and it's also very simple. It's um, um, the heat service, which has um, an API in the conductor and a rabbit in the DB. Okay, now that I said it out loud, it's not sound very simple for a standard service. But anyway, for an open source service, it's pretty standard. Um, so we deployed that in an additional, in an extra region that we have uh, for, uh, for QA, not for development and uh, we plan to move this to production. And it looks very similar to what um, Delmiro described, but everything is managed with OpenStack Helm. It's the stock uh, Helm chart, it's the stock images built by the OpenStack Helm community, and it has uh, it's an addition to the Puppet managed machines. So we have the central HA proxy in front of all services, we have some VMs, and we have um, the, the heat service uh, deployed. RabbitMQ and HitDB is external for now, and we're starting to get some experience for it and starting uh, adding more services and uh, adding more components. Um, the only difference, the only different thing that we try to do is to store everything uh, in our uh, um, Docker registry and uh, our chart museum for charts. Um, so, the other use case that we that we added was um, we had the, some requests for some users from one of the experiments that runs the accelerator, uh, the requirement for a new region. The accelerator runs in a dedicated network and CERN is, is a very uh, old laboratory, so the data center is old, the network infrastructure is old. It works very well, but the design was done in another decade, it's not, uh, very cloud friendly and there are some strong requirements uh, for security, also history. Uh, so what we needed was um, have a complete isolated environment that doesn't have access to a container registry, doesn't have access to any kind of storage that we have a very big safe deployment at CERN. We didn't have access to that, no access to Puppet, and we had to build something from scratch. Um, we thought since the scale is uh, small and we can easily manage it, we can try Helm. And the final requirement was uh, that the users wanted Kubernetes on demand clusters. They wanted to iterate fast, but in this isolated environment, because they have the production services there, and also they have uh, the development environment um, in the same network. Um, so we picked this infrastructure, uh, this architecture for the infrastructure. Uh, we will start with uh, less than 10 compute nodes. And the minimum that we require is um, one database that the DB team, our DB team will provide to us, and uh, Keystone, Glance, Nova, Neutron, Heat, and Magnum. The only component that will be outside this deployment is Keystone because we have um, um, so far four regions, four regions and one Keystone that rules all the regions. Um, so we, what we wanted was self-contained storage, 
self-contained um, container registry. And since this was completely isolated, we didn't have Magnum there, so we had to deploy uh, the initial cluster by hand. Then we could move to a managed cluster. Um, this is in, uh, in development stage for us, but soon uh, we also have committed to our colleagues that uh, we will give them access uh, and they can start using it. So some conclusion notes for me and then next steps for, for Belmiro. Um, so far, uh, OpenStack Helm had a bit um, of a steep learning curve similar to Kubernetes. Uh, so it needed a couple of iterations and then first go simple without it to, st to try to see the benefits of it, uh, which are that the simplified and compact configuration with a few, uh, with a few YAML files and if you start to add, to add more services, you can commonalize all the standard requirements like configuration for logging and so on, and then move only the secrets basically and the few service specific uh, configuration ded in dedicated files for every OpenStack component. Um, with OpenStack Helm, if you start a new cloud, it's uh, very easy to do it because it provides all the dependencies and all like the most common uh, uh, projects are already packaged in charts, and you can start building a, a cloud uh, from, from scratch with it. For large deployments and very opinionated like ours, it's challenging. That's why we did the first initial step um, without it. And some of the drawbacks, um, not very big at, at the moment, is that there is no external secret management to OpenStack Helm. We need to either do uh, plain secrets just encrypted on client side, we cannot use sealed secrets for example, or a CRD instead of our plugin. There are some dependencies in the infra charts, like the RabbitMQ to come from the um, OpenStack Helm repo, and Helm 3 is not supported yet, which is will be a, a massive advantage if we try, if we remove it here. I will pass to Belmiro for our next steps. So, uh, how we see this going? Uh, so summary, we have a uh, few OpenStack projects running side by side with our control plane and also in Kubernetes. So we believe that we will continue to grow or to move the control plane to Kubernetes. Uh, we think that that will be a great approach for us. Uh, however, there are many other tools. Uh, doesn't mean that this really needs to be Elm. Um, so Elm 3 is coming. Customize, maybe it will be simpler. Uh, we didn't play a lot of it uh, yet. What we would really need is flexibility, uh, a tool to that provides flexibility. And also, GitOps uh, is starting to be a big thing now. Um, we have some colleagues looking to Flux to provide that, and maybe we're going to follow that. Um, Integrating logging and metric, uh, we see that we want to deploy everything with the Kubernetes, so we really need to go further in these steps. Um, and service mesh, so if we are moving our control plane to Kubernetes, having service mesh underneath, that will be a big, big plus for us, which is, will be a huge challenge considering our network infrastructure, but this is the way we move things forward, is having big challenge and then of everything with it. So, thank you. Uh, we are happy to answer your questions now. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that we like to is also to hear your experience uh, if you try to deploy the services using Kubernetes. So that is also one uh, of the goals of this presentation, to generate discussion about this. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Um, <coughs> I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is in your cloud architecture chart, I didn't see uh, Neutron, the networking component. Right. Uh, the second question is that you said that you are currently running Kubernetes plus the, the VMs, so right. you are running in parallel. Uh, what's the technology that you use for the VMs way, so. Oh yeah, okay. So w we don't have Neutron, uh, just because we, uh, I, we didn't put it in the slides. Um, but yes, we have Neutron. 
Uh, we have many other components that were not in that slide. That was just an overview, okay? So we have many other components, like Barbican was not there. Uh, Eat, I think, was not there. Um, so yeah, Neutron was missing. Uh, we don't, uh, we, if we leave Neutron, that will be one of the latest components that will move into Kubernetes. <laughs> okay, other story. Um, the other question was about what is the technology uh, in the VMs? So we are running KVM for the virtualization. Um, so that's it, so VMs are created, um, uh, the virtualization technology is KVM, and we run then the VM that runs Glance API, for example, and in Kubernetes, the VMs are again deployed in exactly the same way, but they are they run Qu uh, Kubernetes and then the pods, the Glance API, for example, or EAT. Oh, it's a just uh, which kind of the VM technology? It's like KVM or Zen or I something know, else. I know we use KVM. Yeah. yeah. Any other question? In ten minutes, uh, shall I repeat? Okay, so I think the question was if we plan to move from the testing environment to production. Or, uh, uh, yes, so th that is the ultimate goal to move the, all the production environment for at least for the control plane in Kubernetes and then for the compute nodes uh, as a second step, maybe. Yeah, we are running, r r we are already running some of the components in production. That is. As soon as we feel confident enough, we move them into production. And then there is no way back. That's if it's in production, <laughs> and that's why we do that. Yes. Uh, I repeat the question. Uh, yes, so the question is, Having all this inception in the control plane, can, ca can that cause some problems when VMs are live migrated or something else happens? Um, the answer is yes. You need to know um, really the architecture of uh, your control plane. One of the things that we had a um, few months ago is when w for one of the security um, vulnerabilities, we need to reboot basically the entire cloud. And we do this per availability zone. Uh, we inform the users the availability zone will be down, uh, A will be down. Uh, however, uh, as you saw, the control plane runs also in this infrastructure, meaning that it's not only the control plane that we thought about that actually, but we forgot about the databases that the DB team also runs in, uh, in our clouds. So when we reboot that availability zone, we notice that the nodes came up but the VMs were started, but without network. So what happened? The Neutron database was hosted there. So the, the host hosting the Neutron database was rebooted, the VM come up, but without network, because then the Neutron agents were trying to configure the, the VTAPs of the network, and they were not able to connect to the database because it was running a VM that was rebooted that didn't have network because it needed Neutron. Uh, so you see all this inception, um, you need to understand. After that, of course, we move this to a physical node. It's one of the, those databases that are running a physical node. So more than a question, so we experienced this, and I think um, about the inception is great because you have a very large num number of VMs that provide you a lot of height availability, right? You're sort of if some of the VMs go down, you still have a lot of resources to keep your control plane up. However, moving to Kubernetes means that you're gonna aggregate way more resources in concentrated VMs, so the, the, the risk is gonna be higher. So the observation will be, why don't you just take this opportunity to actually rebump everything from scratch? So rebuilding a new cloud only with Kubernetes for your control plane and migrated everything over there. Uh, 
We think that will be a big overhead for us managing two clouds. So the way we see that with the, the latest developments in Magnum with node groups that we can basically spawn all the cluster uh, between all the different availability zones that we have um, means that we're gonna have the availability having the cluster that runs in different availability zones. So we can consolidate, but be have all these high availability that we have today, the number of resources, the, the VMs and then the pods that we have inside. Fun to consolidate is like for every service we have at least three replicas. So for every availability zone, this will be compact in one or a couple of VMs th rather than having like uh, for every component, one VM per availability zone. And that would be the consolidation for benefit mainly. I, th I think we need to finish. Thank you so much. Thank you.